this edition of Lexington Now, Scarefest, the History Museum, and Lexington Police. Welcome to Lexington Now for the week of September 11th, 2023. One of the country's most popular conventions will be here soon and is celebrating its 15th installment, Scarefest. So my name is Brandon Griffith. I'm the co-owner of uh, Scarefest Weekend here in Lexington. And I'm Nicole Griffith. I am the co-owner of Scarefest and Brandon's wife. Scarefest started in 2008 and this is our 15th show. Like everyone, we lost the, the lost year of COVID and and uh, it, it really was hard on our fans. So uh, we came back and it's bigger than ever. It's kind of um, surprising us every day how much it's, it's uh, really it's kind of exploding. Obviously we're doing something right because it keeps growing every year. So Scarefest Weekend is one of the nation's, if not the nation's largest horror and paranormal themed fan convention. So our tagline is kind of the sinister side of Comic-Con, but don't let that scare you. It's just kind of a play on words, but we are, we're like a, we're like a huge Comic-Con that is, is only geared towards um, horror movies, uh, paranormal, uh, your, you know, TV shows, paranormal investigations, Halloween. So it's basically 100,000 square foot packed with 70 plus celebrities, hundreds of vendors, and just activities for folks that love that kind of stuff all weekend long. So every year we, we bring a lot of guests and we try to, um, you know, look at certain franchises. So like this year, we're having one of the largest um, celebrations of George A. Romero's Day of the Dead. Um, we've also got a 40th year cast reunion for Sleepaway Camp. And we've got, we try to do several of those and, and a Jaws reunion and all those things. And so we have some very good panel moderators uh, that will, you know, work with the talent. And then we try to, you know, get things, have, it's basically just a big conversation. Uh, where people can ask questions and, and find out things that they always want to know about their favorite movies and you know what it's like in the in the celebrity shoes and it, it's just really interesting. We try to give free giveaways at those and you know encourage people to attend. They're a lot of fun. You always learn something or meet somebody new. Um, so yeah, it's uh, panels and, and seminars. So that, that's the panel side of it. Seminars. We have a lot of people that you know are paranormal investigators or know a lot about the equipment or. Uh, are able to, to kind of impart their knowledge through our seminar program for people, and those are 100% free. Website is Scarefest Weekend, and looks like that. And you can, it's, it's a really, really well done website. Um, it's very easy to navigate, to get tickets, everything's bright and easy to find there. It'll have maps, it's got um, a FAQ that answers about every question you could possibly imagine if you just go and look there. Um, you can pre-purchase some merch, um, but also it tells you what hotels to stay at or places to eat in the surrounding area. It's really helpful, especially for first-time congoers. And one thing we're both very excited about is that we have been flooded with calls and new Facebook uh, members and Instagram and all that stuff of people that have never been to a con or never been to Scarefest, and they are coming for their very first time. And so that is really exciting to us. And, I mean, a huge percentage of the, of the pre-sales are people that are brand new, so mm -hmm. that's been awesome. We always go in October, and so this year's dates are October 20th through the 22nd. So we'll have some events though on the 19th for people that are arriving in town, because we have a, a lot of folks that travel from out of state and across the country and Alaska and uh, even one from Australia. So it's, it's, a, it's a worldwide attended event uh, right here in Lexington, Kentucky. And so um, we'll have, a, you know, those startup events on Thursday, and then we'll go all the way through to Sunday afternoon at about five. We try to like, we're one of the, the few shows out there, I think, that really try to incorporate some offsite events and it not just be in the convention center. And so trying to engage like in the community and have those activities and to kind of, you know, help other businesses and things like that. Um, you know, one of our things is, is that we want to make, you know, Lexington, the, not the horse capital of the world, we want to make it the horror movie capital of the world. Uh, and we're very close on our way to that, I think, because <laughs> we, if you go to the website and you look, I mean, some of the 
the folks that we have coming in are just phenomenal, and uh, you know, stacked against even you know shows in other states and things like that. Like we're doing something I think really special right here in the Commonwealth. Uh, we've got six of the seven final ladies uh, in the Friday the 13th franchise, which from what I can tell has not been done, at least in quite a while. Um, we're doing a Jaws reunion with uh, Richard Dreyfuss and, and a few of those cast members. We've got a lot of people from the original Halloween. Uh, Nick Castle, who played the original Michael Myers, James Duke Courtney, who played Michael Myers in the new series. Um, Sleepaway Camp with Felissa Rose. One of the largest, Terrifier 2, which you've watched that. Um, is a huge, huge horror movie right now out there. I have not seen it, but I'm kind of afraid uh, to. <laughs> one of my favorites, uh, we've got a classic uh, Creep Show reunion, which is a movie from George A. Romero and Stephen King. That's one of my so favorites. So we've got Adrian Barbeau, Tom Savini, uh, John Amplis. Um, Warren Chuck. Yep. And so, yeah, so there's a lot of folks coming from that franchise. Now some of the, you know, we've got David Arquette, who is from Scream and several other things. Also a semi-professional wrestler at one point in time. Uh, Bill Mosley from Rob Zombie's Classics and then also uh, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, we've got a couple of leather faces with R.A. Mihaloff and uh, Brett Wagner. Uh, we've got Walking Dead alumni with uh, Chad Coleman, um, Emily Kinney, Greg Nicotero. Brian uh, Bremmer's coming back and he came for the first time last year and, and fans loved him so much. like not just as his character, but as a person. I mean, there were people crying because like, they had such like an experience. It was wild, it was wild, but he's coming back. Yeah. Uh, David Morrissey, who also played the governor on The Walking Dead, and we know that Walk I mean, uh, Walking Dead is real big in Kentucky because Kirkman's from here. Uh, Scarefest weekend, it's uh, the best thing you could possibly do with your family for the Halloween season, and you will create memories for a lifetime. And once people come to our show, it's kind of addictive. They they come every year, so um, prepared to have a lot of fun and meet some great people. Lexington has a rich and varied history, and much of that is on display at the Lexington History Museum, which is now open at its new location on North Broadway. We caught up with Executive Director Dr. Amanda Higgins to get a glimpse of what they have to offer. I'm Dr. Mandy Higgins. I'm the executive director here at the Lexington History Museum, which we just reopened. Um, and we exist to tell Lexington's history, all of Lexington's history from before 1775 through today, um, and to, to do that in a museum setting in an engaging way that helps us understand who we were, who we are, and who we may still be. Thanks to the leadership of Mayor Pam Miller in 1998, we were established um, under a charter with four founding members. Uh, we spent the first 10 years or so of our life in the old courthouse on Main Street. And then in 2012, as we all know, um, mold dust and asbestos and all kinds of things that make you sick were found in that space. And so it was no longer safe for us to be there. Um, the objects, the people, it just wasn't the appropriate place. So we were closed um, for about 10 years. And then thanks again to the city and to the leadership of council and to Mayor Gorton, we have a three-year startup grant and that allowed us to move into this space, the Thomas Hunt Morgan House um, at 210 North Broadway. This building is stewarded by the Bluegrass Trust, but it has a long history. So the original townhouse was built in 1869 for, by Charlton and Ellen Morgan, um, who there's a long history and Bluegrass Trust can tell you all about it, or you can come to the exhibit and learn. Um, but eventually it was deeded to the Women's Club of Central Kentucky in 1965. And so this has been a space that has sort of shaped Lexington in a lot of ways and to then turn it into a museum to make it a truly usable space uh, for the city and to work in partnership with our friends at the Bluegrass Trust is just really excellent. So the public can come Thursdays and Fridays 12 to 4 and Saturdays 10 to 4 and they will experience um, what we're calling a like get your toes wet uh, Lexington history. So our job, our goal is that when you come in, you will learn something new about Lexington. You'll get a chance to explore it. Uh, but we're not here to give you the deep dive about Henry Clay, right? That exists at Ashland. We're not here to give you the deep dive where those deep dives exist elsewhere. Uh, we want to go and to talk about 
things in Lexington that don't necessarily have um, a place where they're being held at the moment. So you'll learn about IBM and the ways that it transformed the city. You'll learn about Thomas Hunt Morgan himself, the first Kentuckian to win a Nobel Prize. You'll get to touch hemp as a, that's already been processed. So that's what we're looking to do. And then if you want to learn more, we want to help you learn more. To, so it may be, we'll say, oh, you are really interested in whatever clay person it may be. Go see our friends at Ashland. Or you are interested in something that we know is held at the University of Kentucky and we can send you there to learn more. So we will be hosting field trips um, and group tours. We're not an event rental space necessarily, but we can talk to folks if they're interested in um, partnerships or collaborations that would make sense with the museum. Uh, we will schedule tours Monday through Saturday, though we encourage you to think about Monday through Wednesday when we're not open to the public to have more of a private tour and definitely a field trip. We depend on a cadre of volunteers and a board. Um, we do have an intern every year. So if folks would like to volunteer, we're always looking for volunteer docents, people to help us with archiving and cataloging our collection uh, and describing our collection. So we would love to, and you can learn more about that on our website at lexhistory.org. We really hope that uh, Lexington will embrace us being back open to the public and we hope you will come see us uh, Thursdays and Fridays 12 to 4, Saturdays 10 to 4. There is an admission fee. You can find all of that information at lexhistory, L-E-X history.org. Uh, please, please come see us. We take a look at the Lexington Police Department next. Welcome back to Lexington Now. We all know the Lexington Police Department is here to ensure the safety of everyone in the city, but there is more to the job than you may realize. Here's a look inside. Well, I'm Jonathan Gist. I'm a police officer here with the Lexington Police Department. My name is Josh Choi. I'm a patrol officer for the Lexington Police Department. My name is Chase Hinderlight. I'm a police officer. I'm Taylor Mitchell. I'm a police officer with the Lexington Police Department. My name is Adam Chavacio. I'm a police officer with the Lexington Police Department. My name is Officer Charles Davis. I'm with the Lexington Police Department. So the city's broken up into three sectors. You got East, Central, and West. Um, all those sectors have a first, second, and third shift. I work Central Sector, first shift, so my hours are 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. I work Central Sector, second shift. I start at 4 in the afternoon and work until 2 in the morning. I work third shift, which is between the hours of 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. Each sector has something called roll call. It's like a mini headquarters for us. Uh, from there, we, uh, we go over the roster, what beat we're going to be assigned to for the day. Uh, from there we can go over uh, patrol briefing, which is essentially just a PowerPoint that kind of gives us persons of interest, vehicles of interest, the events going on in the city that we should be aware of. Kind of lets us uh, strategize on how we're going to be proactive and where we're going to be proactive. Um, but once we leave there, we go to our assigned beats, patrol the area, and take our dispatch calls. Current events, things like that will shape what we respond to in a day. So like the only thing typical is about the first 20 minutes of our shift. My first call of the day can be someone shot, or it could be someone in a vehicle wreck. It could be a stolen vehicle. It could be all kinds of things. So your day is never the same. It always starts out different, and it always ends different. In law enforcement, there is no typical day. Um, you never know what what you're going to get. Every every day is different. Sometimes we'll take five calls a night. Sometimes we'll take upwards to 15 to 20. It gets, it's really one or the other. So as a female officer, I work with a lot of males and I've had nothing but great experiences here. I was the only female in my academy class and I never felt any different. Um, I love the guys that I work with and the supervisors that I've had. It's been nothing but a brother-sister um, relationship and I can't say enough about how hard those guys work and how hard this department works. It's basically a gigantic family. You take care of everybody from all walks of life, all different places across the state, across the country. Put us all together and we're 
expect they work with each other. Um, we watch each other's backs. Uh, I go home to my family at the end of every night because of my family I have here. From my experience, it's more of a family experience. Um, it's really a brotherhood, sisterhood. And I feel that family and that camaraderie um, with the people that I work with. They've been sort of like a, a second family to me. Um, we're all very close. We all get together um, outside of work. We hang out. We uh, do cookouts. Um, we also like to back each other on calls. Anytime that uh, one of us is in trouble, it's a spectacular sight to see a bunch of us show up and know that regardless of who I know, who I don't know, whether I work with them for the last year and a half or if I've just met them that day, everyone's coming to help out. They've preached that it's a fraternity, uh, and, it, and it really is, and you don't really see the scope of that until you're actually in it and working with the same guys every day and then showing up to other sectors when they're busy and, and picking up with those guys like you've known them your whole life and been working with them your whole career. Um, that goes hand in hand with, with how we're able to, to jail with the community because if you jail with your partners, you can usually, that'll usually translate over into any call you're on. Uh, I know myself and my partner is a big thing that we do in between calls sometimes is we go out to the park and we'll see kids playing basketball. Um, and if they're putting up hoops, then we're gonna go and shoot some with them. And uh, I think for the community, the parents see that, they feel that they can approach us. The kids certainly approach us. They wave at us when we drive by now. You know, we try to do all types of community outreach. We try to talk to children. We try to give them experiences with police officers that aren't intimidating or aren't scary. And I love that opportunity to be, I'm maybe the first police officer they've ever talked to. And it's a positive experience. And I hope it leaves them with a feeling that they can always call us if they need us. The majority of the time we, we deal with people on their worst days, um, worst case scenarios. So um, we, we try to do what we can to uh, you know, bring positive light to that and, and help, help people the best we can. It can be at a 10 and then if the right officer shows up, if they've made a connection with, with that person, whether they're going through a crisis or, or some kind of something else that's, that's got them and whatever, whatever they're experiencing, you know. Uh, if they see that officer and they can recognize that and they've made that connection, it can automatically change the pace. We like to build rapport with them, um, get to know our gas station owners, our store owners, and um, just develop a good rapport with them so that way if a big crime were to happen in their store, or if they were to be witnesses to those crimes, they're, they're more open to you know, give us information and um, they won't be so wary of being like, oh, that's the police, yada, yada, yada. Um, they know us as Josh instead of officer so-and-so. The Central Library has thousands of the latest releases to check out, but you can also own some great books and media from the Friends Bookseller. My name's Rod Brotherton, and I am the current president of the Friends of the Library Bookstore. It's the used bookstore for the Lexington Public Library System. And not only do we get books from the library and DVDs and CDs, people donate books to us on a weekly basis, and it's not unusual for us to get a thousand books, CDs, DVDs that we categorize and then resell to the public. And it's amazing some of the stuff we get here. It really is just like a regular library. We've got everything that they do as well, but you can come take it home with you and keep it here. The, the cellar was started in 1969, actually. It was incorporated as a 501c3. And so we predate the current library building, which was built in 1989. And we did move in here into the basement uh, in 1989. And have been here, we've celebrated our 50th year in 2018 and look forward to the next 50. We rely on a lot of volunteer help, and a lot of retired people. So we really think that uh, there's a real opportunity to kind of get involved uh, with the community, students come down and, and help out, and retiree people come and help out, and just regular folks that are, we just want to take a day or two away from the things that they're doing normally come down. I'm Simon Bose. I'm the assistant manager here at Friends Bookseller, and I am the volunteer liaison for a lot of our volunteers here. They're really the backbone of our entire operation. We have high schoolers that are able to donate a few hours of their Saturdays, all the way to retired folks who have come in every week for, for years and years. So it really means a lot when people want to come donate their time, especially be around books. It's a long process from donations all the way to getting it out the door again. Uh, I'd say we process up to maybe 10,000 every month. Uh, 
That all starts in the back sorting room where the volunteers are, uh, goes through a lot of processes up to get to the front. The most surprising thing that has come through here would probably be a first edition signed Gone with the Wind. Uh, it has it was listed on our online sales and it was out in just a few days. So uh, our online sales, which Dan will talk about soon, uh, are a great resource for the community as well. My name is Daniel Mobley and I work in the sorting room at Friends Bookseller as well as the online sales department at Friends. We're having donations that come in regularly that we can easily put in online sales, meaning that they're going to be m like books that are more valuable than the books that we'll put for bargain prices out on the floor. You can find us on our Amazon store, our eBay shop, and also at Discogs. But it'd probably be easiest to find our Amazon store. And in order to find that, you would have to simply Google Lexington Friends Amazon and then click on the first result on the page. My name is Jojo Yan. I'm the store manager of the Friends Bookseller. We try to provide the very affordable discount price books to the community and also find a good home for the books as well. So it is important to um, provide the good service in here. And since people love the facility in this building, the central library, and um, whenever they come to use the facility and they come down to see us. So it's, it's a great thing and it's, it's a nice thing that we have the uh, facility here to share. I enjoy staying at the front desk when I cash out uh, the customers. Um, I learn what they like to read, you know, all their favorite subjects. So when we have uh, the similar subjects or the books they might like, we put them on the side, keep their name on it. So next time when they come in, then, you know, we will check with them. You know, or if they are a friends member, we have their email address, we send them an email, we reach out to them. Friends of the Library is in the basement of the downtown Main Street Library. You can come in the front door or the side door. If you come in the front door, the pendulum is right there, just bear to your right and go down the stairs. Back in full swing this week at City Hall, and there's lots of gavel to gavel coverage you can catch here and on our website. And remember, for the most accurate and up to date information on all city business, check out our website at lexingtonky.gov. Here's this week's meeting coverage. That's all for now, but as always, you can keep up with us on social media, check out the latest traffic updates on Twitter at LexRex, or catch our live traffic cams on LexingtonKY.gov. For all of us at LexTV, I'm Neil Noah, and that's it.